Um, what are those structures of influence? How can you influence? Um, so there is these three areas, arenas, basically, inside the talks, parallel to the talks and completely outside. So inside the talks, it's quite, uh, it's quite obvious how to influence. It's basically, you can be a member of a negotiation delegation, be it a peace negotiation, or po any political negotiation. It can also be a trade negotiation, whatsoever. It's about being a member. The other one, which can be quite influential, actually, is being advisors to the delegations. And um, actually, the Syrian opposition, and when the Geneva peace talks were still on, they had a big delegation of women advisors to the opposition delegation, and they were advising the opposition on all sorts of topics. They just, they just made themselves basically um, um, very important to the delegation because they had all these competent women that were there as advisors. Um, in fact, what people often overlook is technical working groups because most negotiations actually work very little in plenary and work a lot in technical working groups on certain aspects. So getting as more people into these working groups that can also have a gender lens and also can look into the bigger picture is very important. The same is true for commissions. Um, usually commissions, that there might be commissions during negotiations, but certainly after because Every negotiation process ends up in setting up a set of commissions that will take on the results of the negotiations. And we have seen in countries, for example, in Kenya or, or Libya, uh, Liberia, they had made uh, gender quotas for the commissions. And these were also the places where women were then most influential, influential in shaping the, the post uh, agreement phase. There can be advisors to the mediator, of course. Uh, this has been the model in Syria and Yemen. There's a women advisory group. There's a lot of heavy critical discussions about it. Some love it and others hate it. Um, I find the discussion almost like a little bit artificially boring because there's no peace talks. So we, we just can't know whether this instrument has ever worked because it has never been operational, if we are very honest. Um, of course, there can be also observers to the talk. Observers is um, often observer status is given if you want people to be there, but you don't want them to make decisions. So it's also a bit of a tricky thing. There was only one peace process, and that was the one in Liberia where actually the observers were quite powerful because um, they kind of behind the scene influenced the process a lot, but that depends very much on the observers. Parallel mechanisms exist a lot these days. Um, there's, um, there can be civil society forums or regional bodies, all sorts of things in parallel. So I would just say to, to sum this up, the more representation in each of those uh, mechanisms, the better. But the points, again, representation alone is not enough. You need to have also an influence strategy. Then on the outside, um, um, actually the last point, mass action has been the most influential strategy. So whenever, for example, negotiations are stuck, a peace process was stuck, and people were going to the street and making mass action, this was uh, the main factor influencing the peace talks to continue or to get certain things through. So this combination of people, for example, working in the inside and in the outside and having joint strategies when the ones inside know you better do something because we are stuck. Can you do some action? So this sort of um, uh, alliances between politicians and uh, civil society outside of the talks has uh, really brought um, a, lot of, um, a lot of support to processes.